just want to welcome everyone this morning. Welcome you if you're watching us by Facebook Live today. And uh, welcome everyone that's in the sanctuary today. Also, uh, just a couple of things this, uh, this morning. The practice on Wednesday night, there'll be no uh, regular Bible study. The group will be practicing for Christmas Eve. Uh, and so uh, the practice will begin at uh, 6.45, quarter to 7. Uh, if you can be here, that will be great. Also, uh, uh, the Christmas Eve service will be at uh, 7 p.m. Thursday night. Uh, try to, uh, gonna try to accommodate everyone that wants to come, if we can. Uh, as we're, our seating is, of course, limited, as is uh, uh, a lot of other things, the way things are going. So we're just going to uh, do our best to accommodate everyone. Can we stand together this morning? <coughs> Father, we just bow before you today. We ask that you be with us, that your Holy Spirit will have his way this morning. Father, that as we look to you, that Father God, that as we look to you, Lord, you are our source. You are the one, oh God, who can come and meet every need. Yes. And we're trusting you, Lord, to meet Amen. all of our needs. Be with uh, those who will minister today. Yes. Your Holy Spirit, just bless them and be with them and Amen. anoint them, yes. Lord. And Father, we're trusting in your power, Lord, yes, Lord. that you will be with us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Yeah. 
just uh, to go over a couple things that we started off the service with this morning. Uh, we will be uh, meeting here at uh, 6.45, quarter to 7, on Wednesday evening to go over the things that are going to happen on Christmas Eve. The Christmas Eve service will be at, uh, at um, 7 p.m. on Christmas Eve. And so, uh, we, as we said, we'll try to accommodate everyone that wants to come uh, seating is limited of course but we'll try our very best to accommodate everyone uh, 
prayer request this morning. Uh, I'm going to ask in advance if Brother Robert will lead us today. But uh, uh, just uh, remember the families of the men that were lost at sea this week. Uh, some of us know some of the families. And uh, so uh, just uh, continue to remember their families. Can you pray for the girl that had an accident in Halifax? They put her in a coma yesterday. Yes, yeah. yeah, for sure. We will pray for a young lady that had an accident in the city. And uh, pray that uh, she recovers. Also, uh, this morning, uh, Alan, who's generally in church, Alan Morris, uh, is at the ER this morning. Uh, he's got several different issues, so uh, just pray for him. Pray for Simeon, of course, who uh, needs a touch from the Lord. Um, continue to uh, pray for... Uh, our little church that God will continue to bless us and use us in the coming year. Um, there are many more. Is there anyone else today? Sheila has a couple on Facebook. Pray for her son and her sister Barbara. Yes, for sure. For uh, Sheila's son and uh, also for Barbara, her sister. Anyone else? Can you remember Burns Thompson? Yes, yes Burns Thompson, for sure. <laughs> For me, but I have to go for, for a test tomorrow. Y yourself? Yes. Yeah. For Sheila, she has to go for her test tomorrow. Treatments. Pray for those that are going to be shut in over the Christmas uh, season. Also, pray for those that find this season particularly difficult. Uh, there's, you know, uh, there's a lot of talk uh, of joy and peace and happiness this time of year but it's certainly not the case for a great part of our population mm. of folks that have lost loved ones this year all those sort of things that take place in our lives and so pray for them not only here in the sanctuary pray for them in your prayer closet as well and also my sister-in-law Natalie yes. she lost a sister in the night Natalie's okay for Natalie Robbins and her family, of yes. course. Yes. Anyone else? Your brother. Master. Yes. Father. Hallelujah. And friend. Lord. Our Savior. Our peace, our joy, our love, over all in all. God, this morning we come before your presence. We stand in your sanctuary. We thank you, God, for this awesome privilege that you have given unto us. Mighty God, your word declared that unto us a son is born, a child is born. Mighty God, we thank you this morning that you have given us a gift, mighty God, that no man can give us. And Father, we know, Lord God, as the word declared that the nations will be upon his shoulders. Mighty God, that so too, mighty God, we are faced with trials, temptations, and hardships. But mighty God, we know that with you, Lord God, we are fully overcome. Father, this morning... Diverse are the issues. Yes. Many are the challenges. Mighty God, but we know that many are the afflictions of the righteous, but you promised to deliver us out of them all. And so, Father, as we come in your presence, we remember the families right now, Lord, and the men who have been lost at sea. Lord God, we call your names out to you, Lord, and we call, mighty God, that at this point in time, the family will be given enough comfort, that peace, that joy, mighty God, that continues to keep them to press on amidst what is happening. Lord God, it's never easy, but we know that you are a sufficient God. Father, 
We pray this morning for the woman that met in an accident. Lord God in Halifax, we pray, Lord, and we lift her name up to you, Lord God, that you will be her surgeon. That you, O oh God, will bring comfort and restoration. We pray for Simeon. We pray for Alan, who is now in the emergency room. God, that you will be his surgeon. You will be his doctor. You will be his, oh, almighty God. You, you are going to be his all in all this morning. And so, God, we pray, but we know that you deliver. We pray, but you stop the storm. We pray, God, and you show up. And so, Father, this morning, having done all to stand, we are standing in victory this morning. And so, Father, as we come in your presence, we pray for the many, for the many names that have been called that we sometimes it's hard to remember but lord god you are a god that remembers us all and so god as we have called them out in the atmosphere we believe it mighty god that it is done in your name and that your will mighty god shall be done in their lives we pray holy ghost that you will come down in your supernatural and do the supernatural that which we cannot do for ourselves this morning. I pray, God, that your spirit, oh God, will manifest and root up and plant afresh a seed of restoration, a seed of newness, a seed of victory, a seed, mighty God, of healing, a seed, mighty God, of deliverance, a seed, oh mighty God, of restoration in the lives of your people this morning, we pray. Holy Spirit of God, we thank you this morning for this awesome fellowship that we have. We thank you this morning for this coming together. And so God, we know that many are missing from the number. Many don't have this opportunity this morning. Many, oh God, are still searching, still searching for the creator, still searching for that hidden void, that vacuum that cannot be filled in your souls. But I pray, God, as we lift up their names, whatever, whatever circumstances they are in, whosoever they are this morning, oh Lord God, we pray that you will do that which we cannot do, Lord God, this morning. We pray for the people, hallelujah, on Facebook who have reached out to us this morning for us to pray for them. Lord God, the very prayer requests that have been made in this congregation, we place them in your hands, Lord. We yes, place Lord. them at your feet. We leave them at the altar. We leave them in your hands, God. And we say, Lord God, come true for us this morning. Come true, Daddy yes, God. Lord. And ride in King Jesus. Jesus. Let no man in the thee. Ride in, Daddy God. Lord God, we call upon you, Lord Jesus. No other friend we know but you, God. No other king we know but you, God. No other God we know but you. And so, Father, we come in your name, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. We know that in this season, some might have joy, some might have peace, some might have, oh God, burden. But God, we know that in this season, it lies, there is hope, there is still hope. For those who are seeking, for those that are burdened, for those who are heavy laden. And so God, this morning, irrespective of the condition, irrespective of the state of mind, I pray God that you will breathe afresh upon their lives. Breathe afresh in this season and be that comforting voice with a oh Lord to minister in this situation. I pray God that as we go through this season, let it not be one of a ritual, let it not be one of just a walk through, but let it be a time of reflection, let it be a time of giving you all the glory. Because Lord, we know that in in this in such a time as this uh, mighty God we are faced with many things we are faced with many obstacles but we know God you shall surely deliver hallelujah spirit of the living God we place this morning's this morning's devotion in your hands we place this morning's word in your hands 
We place this morning, Almighty God, your servant in your hands. We pray, God, that you will take over. You will take charge. Let self decrease this morning and let the Holy Spirit, uh, let you alone increase in our lives this morning. Minister, oh God, to us this morning. Let your ministering angels stand and watch to God and to allow your word to accomplish that which it was sent to accomplish. In your name we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 The children can go downstairs as uh, Pastor Fred comes to minister the word this morning. chapter 1. I want to greet those who are tuning in online. It's great to see you on the other side of the internet. Matthew chapter 1. We'll read verses 3, 5, 6, and 16. We're reading through some of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Verse 3. Judah begot Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Perez begot Hezron and Hezron begot Ram. Verse 5 and 6. Solomon begot Boaz by Rahab. Boaz begot Obed by Ruth. Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David the king. And verse number 16. And Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who was called Christ. Let's pray. Our precious Heavenly Father, we once again bow in your presence and acknowledge that you are the King of Kings and that you are the Lord of Lords. And Lord, we know that you desire to minister to every person that's seated here today and to every person that's tuned in via Facebook. So Father, I pray that our hearts will be prepared to receive your word this morning that you would encourage, that you would strengthen, that you would challenge, that you would help us to realize how much you love us yes. and how much you desire to minister and to move in our lives. Lord, I pray once again for liberty and freedom in the Holy Spirit. Yes. I pray that you would minister through me, that you would hide me behind the cross, that through it all I would increase or decrease and you would increase, that people would see you ministering in this church in these families and in this community. And we give you the glory and the honor and the praise. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You don't belong here. Amen. I want you to hear that once again. You don't belong here. Go ahead. Look around at everybody here. Go ahead. And when you look at them, think to yourself, you don't belong here. But yet, here you are. Sitting 
in God's house, in God's sanctuary. Just like the people in Luke 14, 21, after the master said, go out and tell all the people that we've invited to the supper to come. And those people had made up excuses and said, I'm too busy with this and I'm too busy with that and I don't want to go. And then the father says, go out quickly into the streets and into the lanes of the city and bring in here the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind. They didn't belong in that parable at that supper, but yet there they were. Last week when Brother Dick was preaching, he said, Jesus is the subject of the season, but we are the reason for the season. And this passage of scripture proves that very point. That Jesus is the subject and we are the reason for the season. And the very fact that you don't belong here and that you are indeed here also proves that very same fact. From Abraham to Jesus, there are 72 generations of men. Seventy-two. But yet, in those seventy-two generations of men, we see five women. And to those five women, we say, you don't belong here. But yet, like us, there they are. Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, Bathsheba, and Mary. In a Jewish culture that focused on the finest pedigree, one would think that Matthew would deliberately leave out the so-called imperfections of Christ's family tree. But yet, he didn't. Let's find out why these five women don't belong here. The first woman is found in Genesis 38, if you want to note that down and read her story later. But it's the story of Tamar. Tamar was married to a man who was wicked, and God had him killed. According to tradition, she was then to marry the next in line, the next brother, because she didn't have any children with this man. The brother refused to have children with her, so God had him killed as well. Then she was promised the third brother, who at the time was too young to marry. And she was told that when he became of age, that he would be given her as her husband to bear children for her. But when he became of age, she was not given to Tamar to bear children. See, Tamar was pushed aside. Because she was pushed aside, she was forgotten about, and she was neglected. And because she was pushed aside and forgotten about and neglected, she decided to take things into her own hands. She had heard how her father-in-law was going to make a journey because it was time to sell the, the, the wool from the sheep. And so she ran ahead and dressed herself up as a prostitute and sold herself to her father-in-law and she became pregnant. Because she was pushed aside, she was in pieces. She was broken. 
See, in a culture where a woman's worth was based on her ability to produce children, and here she was, childless. And the worst part about it is she was persecuted. She was judged by her father-in-law, the very same man who did the exact same thing that she had did when he had found out that she was with child. And then she wanted to have her killed. And then he discovered the truth, that he was indeed this, the father of this child. Sometimes we as well push people aside. Sometimes we miss those who are broken in pieces. Sometimes we miss those who are persecuted. Sometimes we persecute those who are living in the same sin that we are living in. Yet Jesus saw Tamar. Jesus saw this woman who was pushed aside. Jesus saw this woman who was forgotten and neglected. Jesus saw this woman who was broken in pieces. Jesus saw this woman who was persecuted and judged for the sin that was going on in her life. Yes, Jesus saw Tamar in Genesis chapter 38, but Jesus still sees the Tamars in 2020 in our community, in our province, in our country, and around the world. Jesus sees those who are pushed aside. He sees those who are forgotten and neglected. He sees those who are broken and at the end of their rope. He sees those who are being persecuted for whatever reason and Jesus came and says to them, yes, you don't belong here, but I want you to belong here. I've come here to make you a part of the family of Almighty God. You may have been that Tamar who was pushed aside, who was forgotten about and neglected, who was broken in pieces at rock bottom. You may have been that person who was persecuted and judged by the church because of the sin that was going on in your life. Yet Jesus Christ looked through all that and yes he knew that you didn't belong here but he came so that you would indeed belong here and there's those that we cross paths with that don't belong here but yet God through his mercy and grace has empowered us to reach out to those Tamars in our community that need a touch from Almighty God. The second woman that doesn't belong here is Rahab. She's found in Joshua chapter 2 if you want to read her story. Rahab is mentioned eight times in the Bible. And six of those eight times, the same noun is used to describe her. That noun, I heard seen somebody just mouth it, prostitute. Six of the eight times that she's mentioned in the Bible, it says Rahab the prostitute. Rahab the sinner. Rahab the enemy of God by her choice. She doesn't belong in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. She was a prostitute. She was a sinner. The Bible also tells us that she was a Canaanite. A Canaanite was an enemy of God's people. She didn't belong, but yet there she was. Not only was she a prostitute and a sinner and an enemy of God's people, even though she was those things, 
She perceived. She perceived what was going on and what God was doing. She was more in tune with the Spirit of God than probably some people in the camp with Joshua. She saw how God was using the Israelite people to conquer nation after nation after city after city. And because she saw that, she wanted to make sure that she would live. She didn't want to be killed like everybody else. So I think there was a little bit of self-centeredness in her life. Because she perceived what the Spirit of God was doing. And said, I'm going to do whatever I can to make sure I'm not one of them that get left behind and up on the wrong side, as Brother Saul just said. And because she perceived what God was doing, she chose to protect the children of Israel and hide them in her house, to lower them out a window in the evening. She decided to serve the people of God. She was a prostitute, a sinner, an enemy of God's people. But because she saw what was going on, she decided to serve those who followed Jehovah. What I like about the fact is that Jesus also saw Rahab. Jesus saw this prostitute, this person uh, given into sin, who was trapped and ensnared with no way out. He also saw that she was an enemy of God's people. But he also saw a heart that was open, a heart that was searching, a heart that was looking. On the outside, if you had looked and saw Rahab, you never would have known that she was looking for something more, that she was looking to an answer, that she was looking for a way of escape from the lifestyle that she was living. Yet Jesus saw into the depths of her heart, and he realized that she was looking for something real. Something to get a hold of. Something to grab and to put her faith and her hope and her trust in. And because of that, she was saved and she was brought in to the family of God. And although she didn't belong in the genealogy, she ended up there because her heart was looking for something more. And she found the answer to all of her problems. She found the answer to her sin. And his name today is Jesus Christ. Yes, she was an enemy of God's people. But because she accepted Jehovah and eventually accepted the Savior, she in turn was brought in. And the thing is, God still sees the Rahabs today. Amen. He sees those who are entrenched in sin, who can't seem to find their way out, who are bound by the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. Amen. He sees how they're an enemy of his people, how they've chosen to be that way. But he sees through that sin and he sees through that heart that's crying out at night saying, there's got to be more. There's got to be something more to this life than that what I'm living right now. And Jesus is looking today in 2020 and he sees the Rahabs Amen. that we see and that we rub shoulders with. And all we see is the sin, and we see how they're separated from God, and we see how they're an enemy of God by their own choice. But we need to stop looking on the outside and say, God, let me touch their heart with your love, with your grace, with your mercy, with your salvation, with your deliverance, with your victory, with your hope. God, let me penetrate the outside and touch their heart with your love. So thankful that Jesus sees the Tamars and he sees the Rahabs. And thirdly, we see Ruth. There's an entire book devoted to Ruth. There's even parts that 
people use in their wedding vows. Because of the words spoken by Ruth. The first thing I see when I think about Ruth is I see her passion. I see her love for her mother-in-law. After her mother-in-law's husband had passed away and her husband had passed away, she was given the opportunity to stay in Moab and to start her life all over again. But she told her mother-in-law, no, no, where you go, I'll go. And your God will be my God. She had a great love for her mother-in-law. And she was willing to give up everything else, where she was from, who she was, to go and to follow her mother-in-law. She was a Moabite. A Moabite was the worst of the worst according to the Jewish people when it came to Gentiles. But yet here we have Ruth somehow found her way and worked her way into the genealogy of Jesus Christ. See, when she gave everything up and went with her mother-in-law, she went back poor. She had nothing. She had to glean the fields after the farmers had went through and took the best of the crop. She had to go and pick the corners and the leftovers. She was so poor that they left handfuls of corn on purpose for her to pick up and eat. She was poor because she had a passion for her mother-in-law and she left everything behind to follow the woman that she loved. She had a passion. She was poor. But in the end, she was purchased. She was redeemed. And because of that, she was married. And she had a child named Obed with her husband Boaz and because of her passion and because she was purchased she was part of something that was much bigger than herself she became an ancestor of the king of kings and the lord of lords Jesus saw Ruth back in the book of Ruth he saw her passion, how she was willing to lay everything aside to follow her mother-in-law. He saw that she was poor. One of the questions that John the Baptist, or one of the, when John the Baptist, pardon me, asked Jesus a question saying, are you the one? One of the answers that Jesus gave was the gospel is preached to the poor. It's one of the signs of being a church, of bringing the gospel that's being preached to the poor. Isn't that what Christ did as well? He purchased us when he went to the cross, when he came as we celebrate his birth during this Christmas season. He came to purchase us, to buy us back. See, Jesus saw Ruth. He saw her passion, how she was willing to give everything up and to become poor. And because of that, he knew she needed to be purchased. And Jesus sees those today, the Ruths, the Ruths in our generation, those who have a passion, who have a heart for things. He sees those who are poor. He sees all of us who need to be purchased by his blood. Like Ruth, she didn't belong here. In the Ruths of our day, they too didn't belong here. But yet here they were. I'm so thankful that he saw the Rahabs, the Tamars, 
and the roofs. And finally, we see the fourth lady in our story, Bathsheba. If you want to read her story, it's in 2 Samuel chapter 11. The first thing I reflect on when I think about Bathsheba is I think about the fact that she was plagued. Here she was bathing, minding her own business in her bathtub when the king who should have been off to war was pacing around on his roof and he looked down and he saw this beautiful woman taking a bath. And although he was married multiple times and had many wives, he decided that he wanted to have Bathsheba. And he sent his men to go and get her and to bring her back to the king, to the, to the palace, so he could have relations with her. Scripture doesn't declare how much she was involved, whether she was realizing I'm looking at the king who would have me killed, or she was completely willing, we don't know. But I tend to look at it from the fact that you had a man who was the most powerful person in the world today telling somebody to do something, and I'm going to be convinced that that person's either going to do it or die. So I see Bathsheba oppressed by a person in power. The thing that gets me when I read the genealogy, Matthew doesn't even mention her by name. He says, by her who was the wife of Uriah. He doesn't address her by Bathsheba. He completely ignores her name. This woman that was oppressed by a person in power. And because she was plagued and oppressed, I can see and I can feel her pain when I read through her story. She becomes expected with child. What does the king do? The king has her husband killed. And because of David's sin, the Bible says her baby dies. In less than nine months, her husband is gone. She was oppressed by the king. Her baby dies. All because King David wasn't where he was supposed to be. And all because King David wanted something he shouldn't have had. Here is Bathsheba completely alone. So I can relate to her pain. But then all of a sudden she marries the man who created that pain. She marries the man that had her husband killed. I can just imagine barring the grace of God how every time she saw him those memories, the pain of her past, her loss came flooding back. The other thing I see about Bathsheba is that she was a peasant, a commoner. But yet, that peasant was brought to the palace where she was able to live the rest of her life. But I'm still convinced, even though she was in the palace, she was hiding all that pain from her past. She was hiding the pain that her husband was murdered by the king. She was hiding the pain of the fact that her baby died. And I think of many in the church today who were peasants, who then became born again and were brought into the palace, into the kingdom of Almighty God. But there's something in their past. There's a pain in their past that they're still holding on to. That's just as real as the day that it happened. 
even though they're born again and their name is written in the book of life, when you mention it or think about it, it's like it's just happened. It could be a hidden sin that you haven't been able to overcome. You don't do it anymore, but the temptation is just as real as it was when you were lost. Maybe something's happened to you that somebody's done something in your past. And that pain is just as real. Maybe you did something in your past. And because you now realize that it's wrong and you shouldn't have done it, the guilt and the shame that comes with it still hangs over your head. You were a peasant, but you're now in the palace, but you still have all this pain. But Jesus came to take away that pain. The Bible says, if you're in Christ, you're a new creation. All things has passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I like the fact that Jesus looked back to 2 Samuel chapter 11 and she saw and he saw Bathsheba and she, he saw that she was plagued and that she was in pain and that she was a peasant in the palace still holding on to that pain and I'm so thankful that Jesus looks today in 2020 and he still sees the Bathshebas that are walking out amongst us that are in our communities that won't go to church anymore because they were hurt they're sitting here in the church today and he sees how much pain they're in and he's saying I came for you I know you're plagued I know you're in pain I know you're a peasant but I've come to take away that pain I've come to bring you into the palace I've come to make you princes and princesses in my kingdom I've come to make you an overcomer I've come to make you more than a conqueror it's time to declare the promises of almighty God and say God yes I'm plagued yes I'm oppressed Yes, I'm in pain, but God, here it is. I give it to you. You went to the cross of Calvary to take away that pain, to bring me joy, to bring me peace, to bring me healing, to bring me hope, to give me everything that I need in this life. For your word says the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. It's time for the church of Jesus Christ to get some righteousness, to get some peace, and to get some joy in the Holy Ghost. He didn't come to leave you broken. He came to make you whole. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Thank Amen. There's Bathshebas that God wants you to reach out to Hallelujah. and to minister to. Yes. I need to close. We've missed one woman in this whole entire story. And I deliberately did that until now. The fifth woman is Mary. Mary doesn't belong in this story. She don't belong here. Mary was a virgin. She was pure. It was impossible for her to have a child. But yet here she is in the genealogy of Jesus Christ as his mother. There's two reasons why Mary is here. The first is a miracle. Behold, the Holy Ghost shall come upon you, and you shall bring forth a son. And you shall call his name Jesus. Every single one of us is here for the exact same reason. M-I-R-A-C-L-E. Miracle. 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 You are in the family of God because of a miracle. The second reason... She's there is because she said yes to God. By saying yes to God to bring forth the Son. 
She knew the consequences. How do I tell my fiance that I'm expecting a baby that isn't his and I've not known a man? I don't think I would believe anybody who came and told me that story. She knew that the punishment for having a baby outside of wedlock in her day was to be stoned to death. Yet she says, Behold the handmaiden of the Lord. She was here because she said yes to God and because of a miracle. You're in the kingdom of God because you said yes right. to God. Yes. And because of a miracle. What do we learn from Mary's story? We can learn to say yes to God. We can say yes when we don't focus on the circumstances around us. What about the other four? What do we learn from Tamar? We learn that God can make something good out of the worst parts of our life. God can take your mess and make it a message. God can take your trials and make you triumphant. God can take your tests and give you a testimony. I remember the day I prayed the sinner's prayer in a bar in front of a gambling machine. I remember saying, God, I don't know why you've come into this place to talk to somebody like me. I was a drunk. I was an alcoholic. Well, same thing. I was addicted to gambling. I was addicted to drugs. I was steeped in sin. And God walked in that day and I said, God, I don't know why you want me, but if you want my life, here it is. God can make something good out of the worst part of your life. We also learn that God can work through a family fraught with deception, incest, and prostitution. He can work through you. What did we learn from Rahab? There's hope for the wickedest of sinners as she turns from sin to the Savior. And in spite of what she's done or you and I have done, the Lord can renew all of us. What do we learn from Ruth? With God's help and grace, we can turn our backs on our old life. And we're never too old to start over. What do we learn from the, uh, what do we learn from the story of Bathsheba? We learn that you have not committed the unforgivable sin and that you can be a peasant and end up in the palace. So Fred says you don't belong here. You shouldn't be here. Your name shouldn't be in the genealogy of Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 1. That's what Fred says. But it doesn't matter what Fred says because Jesus says, you belong here. I destined you to be in my kingdom. I came from heaven to earth to, just to take you and to say, you belong here. I went to the cross so I would pay the price for your sin and in turn say, you belong here. You belong in my family. You belong in my kingdom. You belong in the palace. I came and I died for all men everywhere so that they too can belong in the kingdom and in the family of almighty God. And it's time for us when we leave the doors of this church to look at every single person that comes across our path and have us to say you also belong in the kingdom of God. God use me. Take my life 
and help me to see that every sinner, every person that's hurting, every person that's addicted, every person doesn't have their life together, and allow me, Lord, to look at them through your eyes and declare in my spirit that they belong in the kingdom of God, that God is their answer, that God is their hope, that God is their peace, that God is their joy, that God is the answer to all of their problems, and in turn will say, you belong in the kingdom of Almighty God because Jesus Christ had declared it, because Jesus Christ had did it. And Jesus is saying, whosoever comes may come into the family of Almighty God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's not who's in your family tree. It's whose family you've been grafted into. And the Bible says we've all been grafted into Jesus' kingdom, into his family. Would you stand with me this morning? I want you to know that you all belong here. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I have two questions, maybe three. The first question is, maybe you're listening by Facebook or you're here today, and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You've not been brought into the family of God. But you realize that you need to say yes to God to be brought into that kingdom. And in turn, Jesus will do the miracle and forgive you of your sin and to bring you into his family. If you're here today saying, I don't know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and I want to be a part of his family, would you raise your hand? I want to pray with you. If you're listening by Facebook and you want to invite Christ into your life, send me a message. I'll contact you after and pray with you and encourage you. Maybe you're here today. And one of the five ladies, four ladies spoke to your heart. Maybe you look back and you think of Rahab, Tamar, Bathsheba, Ruth, and something through this morning's message spoke to your heart. Maybe it's something in your past. Maybe it's a hidden sin. I don't want to know what it is. I just want to pray for you. But if there's something that spoke to you that you realize that you need God's help with this morning, would you raise your hand? I want to pray with you. I want to pray for you. Is there any today saying, that's me, Pastor? Maybe it's a pain of your past. Something happened. It's just as fresh today as it was when it happened. And my final question, and it's the one that I need to pray, is I need to be in tune with the Spirit of God that when I leave this place, And I see those in my community, and I see the Ruths, and the Tamars, and the Bathshebas, and the Rahabs. That I see them the way Christ sees them. And that's the fact that they belong here. They belong in the kingdom of God. And I need to pray that God gives me a more sensitive heart. That God gives me a greater vision for the lost. And if you're here today to say, Pastor, I need that same focus from God. I need a renewed focus on the harvest. I need a renewed vision of the lost. Because the time is short and God is willing that none should perish. And you're saying, God, you can use me in this harvest field. If that's you this morning, would you raise your hand with me and say, that's me, Pastor. Help me have a renewed focus on the harvest and to do my part. Let's pray together this morning as we get ready to dismiss. Our precious 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you desire to show us how and why we belong in the kingdom of God. It's because we said yes to you. It's because you performed the miracle. And Father, we thank you that you came and you paid the price. And you came from heaven to earth and walked among us and then went to the cross, taking our place, shedding your blood so that in turn our sins might be forgiven. And Father, we think of the four ladies that we learned about today. And Lord, I know that each of them touched an area of my life. I'm sure that they touched others that are listening today as well. So Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that we would realize that we are new creations in Jesus Christ. Because I just heard Brother Shaw say, there is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ. Some of us carry guilt, the guilt of our past. But Lord, I pray we would turn it over to you and realize that we're no longer condemned because of the cross. Lord, some of us are holding pain from our past because of abuses that have happened to us. And the pain is just as real today as it was when it happened. And it's holding us back. It's plaguing our present. It's affecting our future. But Lord, I pray today that we would lay it at your feet. Because you came to heal the brokenhearted. You came to bring peace and joy and comfort and strength. I pray you would do that for the body of Christ today and those listening via Facebook. And Father, as we get ready to close this morning, I pray that we would begin to see the lost in a different light. That we would see beyond the sin. That we would see beyond the brokenness. That we would see beyond the addiction. That we would see beyond whatever's going on in their life that we would see that they belong in the family of God. And I pray, Father God, that you would give us a renewed passion for the lost, a new hunger to seek your face for those who don't know you. But I pray that we would lift up our eyes and see the harvest and say, Lord, here am I, send me. Lord, I pray for laborers into your harvest as we go our separate ways. Lord, I pray you would bless us, that you would protect us, that you would make your face to shine upon us and to give us your peace, that people would see righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost operating in the lives of your church. And they'll ask and become hungry to begin to see the hand of God move because we're believing that you're going to use us, this little church, to make disciples of all nations. Father, we thank you for what you're doing, what you have done, and for what you're going to do. And Lord, bless us and be with us as we go. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. We'll see you tonight at 6 o'clock. And again, of course, Wednesday for the Christmas Eve practice.